this is actually a question that was brought up in um, the last stream. And I kind of had an idea of how to approach it. And so I figured that I would continue those thoughts here and we discuss it while I work through it. It would get crushed. Well, let's see. We don't know exactly, do we? Um, so first things first. Let's go ahead and talk about a little bit about tidal forces. So a tidal force is basically a differential force that's caused by the fact that you have two bodies near each other. In this case, we have our spacecraft and our either white dwarf or neutron star. And the force across one of the bodies is not this, it's not constant, it changes. And so in this case, we're going to end up getting a differential force across the spaceship due to it being on the surface of either our white dwarf or neutron star. Oh, this question has already been done before. All right. If so, this is my attempt at it. Um, as I stated earlier, I'm just going to be thinking through the problem and using math along the way. All right. So let's go ahead and get an equation for I t for the tidal force. And given that I've, I've done this in the past already, I'm just going to basically just copy and paste the equation we've already derived. Actually, I can write something here as to what's going to help us solve that. So let's make sure that you guys can see everything just fine. OK, that font's very small. Let's do this. Let's blow it up a little bit. And so I know that there are a lot of new people here, thanks to Pamela. And so I'm going to hopefully I get the chance to say hi to everybody. Um, if you say something in the in the chat, I will definitely say hi to you. For example, hi Peter, hi Larry, hi well, hi Pamela, <laughs> um, hi Henny's Vorce Warp Warp. Okay, I, I definitely killed that. I apologize. Hi, hi Hanny, um, hi Uncle Bill Druin. Welcome guys. All right. So I was in the process of finding that equation. But at the very least, we can do this. So tidal force equation. And typically for my streams, I use um, LaTeX to display everything. And so that's what I'm going to be using today, guys. For everyone who's new, that is. Um, so what we want to do is state that the tidal force, which is a differential force, which I'll denote as delta F, um, probably sub T for tidal, it's going to be equal to, let's say, some infinitesimally small force over some infinitesimally small um, length, dfdr times some delta R. And once I fully um, write out the equation, let's typeset this. Hmm. It's not liking something here. Begin a line. Frac. Oh, I see. That's why. I didn't actually complete this fraction, which is not going to be a fraction. Let's do that. That should fix it. All right, and I can scroll down now. And so basically our tidal force is going to be, it's going to basically equal this um, differential equation dfdr times delta r. Now I'm not going to get to exactly to ex exactly into what these variables are until I'm fully done with the equation. But basically the differential um, that we're going to be taking, the dfdr, is it's going to be the differential of Newton's gravitation um, force equation with respect to um, changes in length. And that is changes in length between our two um, our two bodies, the spacecraft and the white dwarf or neutron star. 
Um, let's see. I, and I don't want to have to go through the derivative again, even though I could. I prefer not to. So what I'm doing now is I'm 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 going through a bunch of the past streams. Here we go, tides, in which I've already derived the equation. All this information is stored on my computer, so you can't really see what I'm doing. But here we go. So I think it's this one. So I'm just going to do a quick copy and paste. And let's fix the formatting there so it's a little bit clearer. All right, and so this is going to be the equation we're going to use today for our differential force um, on the spacecraft due to the white dwarf or neutron star. Um, and basically what the variables are on the right-hand side of the equation, G is going to be our gravitational constant. M is going to be the mass of either our white dwarf or neutron star, depending on whichever one we choose. Um, M is going to be the mass of our spacecraft. The delta R is going to represent the physical length of our spacecraft um, radially compared to the, or radially along the, one of the radiuses of the, of the neutron or white, neutron star or white dwarf. And the capital R in the denominator represents, in this case, the white dwarf being on the surface of either our neutron star, our spacecraft being on the surface of either our neutron star or white dwarf. R is going to represent the radius of the neutron star white dwarf, depending on whichever one we're working with. And so, if we were to now go ahead and look online for some basic values, because off the top of my head, I do not know what the typical size of typical size or mass of a spacecraft or or a white dwarf or neutron star is. So we're going to use some online resources to do that. This part I will show you. So let's go ahead and let me make sure I'm keeping up with the comments here. Okay. All right, see you later, Cosmic Lattice. So let's go ahead and add another window here so that you guys can see exactly what I'm doing. Slightly make some changes to this. And I'm back on the screen. So what we want to do now is we, need to we want to find exactly, well, what's the typical mass of a white dwarf star? Let's go ahead and use a white dwarf for, as, our, as our star here. So mass, the typical mass of white dwarf. Use wiki. Let's go with Wikipedia and see what they state here. Okay, so white dwarfs um, have a mass range somewhere between 0.17 solar masses to about 1.33 solar masses. So let's just go ahead and make this simple. Oh wait, the mass distribution is strongly peaked at 0 0.6 solar masses. Okay, well then we're gonna go with 0 0.6 solar masses. And of course we're gonna use um, SI units and not solar masses, so if I'm not mistaken, a single solar mass is, is on an order of 10 to the 30 kilograms, I think. So I think it's two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Let's go ahead and verify that. 
we do not want to use incorrect values here. So let's see, one solar mass to kg. I think it's 10 to the 30. Yeah, all right. So um, the mass of our white dwarf, so we're going to drop, oops. We're going to get rid of our internet here page, and we're going to go ahead and write down what that mass is. So the mass of, the, of a white dwarf, um, and we're using 0 0.6 solar masses as, as, as a typical mass, that's going to be 0 0.6 times so 2 times 10 to the 30 times 0 0.6. This gives us 1.2 times 10 to the 30. And so next, of course, we're going to need to know exactly, well, what is going to be the, the radius? So we're saying m is equal to this. And what is the typical radius of a white dwarf? So we're going to go back to our good friend, the internet. <laughs> I probably can even use Wikipedia, actually. And if I'm, and I'm sure there's probably a mass radius relationship for white dwarfs. Because if there is a mass radius relationship for white dwarfs, then I can just simply know exactly what the radius is given the mass that we're using. I'm not exactly seeing anything here, so mass radius. I'm not exactly seeing anything here for that. So we're just going to go with a radius of 0 0.9 solar radii. Let's just go with that. But if there is a mass radius relationship for white dwarfs, then this would be off, of course. Okay, that's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> it made the screen look weird there. So let's do this. OBS, and then let's go back and let's just remove. Let's remove it that way. Let me quickly check comments to see if I haven't missed anything here. Okay. So we're doing 0 0.9 um, solar radii. So let's just do a quick copy and paste. For the radius of the white door, so R. So we're working at SI units, so we're going to have to use meters. And a solar, radi or solar radius is equal to, there was a time when I could just recite all this information just off the top of my head, but it's been a while since I've used these, these constants. Let's 
see. And so again, I've just went to, to, to Wikipedia and the radius of the sun is about 696,000 ish kilometers. And for the sake of this problem, we're yeah, for the sake of this problem, we're just gonna round that. We're gonna round it to seven hundred thousand kilometers. So we'll, we're still in the same order of magnitude, but the value is gonna be slightly increased. And so we're doing 0.9%. That's is that what I saw? That seems extremely small. Let's just go with one percent. Actually, that make, that also makes the math even simpler. So that the radius of, of this of our white dwarf is going to be one percent of the radius of the sun. Okay. So given that we're using using seven times ten to the five kilometers, and I should put up here that this is going to be in units of kilograms. We're using seven times ten to the five no meters, excuse me. No, but that, that was kilometers. Seven times ten to the five kilometers. So we're going to end up getting seven times ten to the eight meters. So seven times ten to the eight meters. And we want to use only one percent of that, which is ten to the negative one. So we drop, we reduce by a factor of ten. All right, so this is going to be the radius of our white dwarf. So given these conditions for our white dwarf, we also need to know, well, what is the typical mass and um, size of a space shuttle? And this is something that I definitely don't know. So we'll definitely have to use the internet to find this information, unless someone else here knows. But for now, I'm just going to go ahead and go online and see what I can find. All right, so um, let's bring back our internet. Use the BFS, okay. So open up another tab here. So BFS, um, spaceship. Um, let's see, let's see if it gets automatically will give us Okay, is the BFS different from is it that much different from the BFR or are they one and the same? No, it's <laughs> That's what that stands for. <laughs> okay. Um Okay, this is actually good because it also gives us a shape as well, which is going to be important for our problem. Um, and I'm just going to assume, based off of what I'm seeing here, a cylindrical shape. All right. <clears throat> so, so its length will be 48 meters. Cool. Has a dry mass of 85 or 187,393 pounds. And so its its propellant mass will be
Whoa, that's insane. I don't look at space shuttles that much, so. 1100 metric tons, that's. So the, the propellant itself, if I'm reading this correctly, is what takes up most of the mass? Wow, okay. Um, for right now, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that we've landed this spacecraft on the, on, the, on the surface of a white dwarf or a neutron star. Again, we've assumed that there's, we don't have to worry about heat or magnetic fields, which, I mean, for us, essentially can be kind of true. Um, if we assume that the white dwarf or the neutron star has been allowed to evolve over a very, 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 very long time, because most of the heat would have been dissipated anyway, and the magnetic field would die down as well if it's a neutron star. So um, we're going to go with the fact that we're going to assume that it has no propellant. So they're pretty much stranded on this on this white dwarf or neutron star. And so we're just going to go with the dry mass, which I'm assuming is just strictly the spaceship itself, of 85 metric tons, which is 187,393 pounds. But we need to convert that to SI units. So I'm going to open up another um, hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, that's not even actually a mass, actually. That's a weight. Pounds is a... Pounds is a unit of, of, of force. So I need, I need actual, just, I need strictly mass, which we can get. So let's go ahead and take our pounds and convert it to a mass. So pounds, yeah, pounds to kilograms. So I'm just going to copy and paste this. And so that's the equivalent of, and that's a very nice number, 85 metric tons. Okay, that's what that, that's what that is. Um, so 85,000 kilograms is the mass of our um, space shuttle. Let me look at comments really quickly. Oh, thank you, Larry. Exactly what I was thinking. That's pretty massive, but even more massive is the amount of propellant. That's so is that where most of the weight typically comes from with a space shuttle? Even though it loses that weight as it, you know, over time, but let's see. Let's go ahead and write that down though. So really what we're doing right now, guys, is getting all of the variables that we don't know the, the values to. We're getting values for them. So the mass of space shuttle. Or spacecraft and of course we've assumed this to be <laughs> the BFS <laughs> um, so lowercase m is going to be equal to 8.5 let's copy and paste actually this makes it simpler so 8.5 times and it was 85,000 so that would have been 8.5 times 10 to the 4. And this is going to be in units of kilograms. The next thing we're going to need, of course, is, is the physical length, which we already had. But I think, I think I saw Larry already put it up there. Hey, Adam. Um, let's see. 80, so 48 meters. 
Is that what we want to go with? The 48, 48 meters in length? All right, so 48 meters. Oh, this is from Wiki. Thanks, Larry. All right, so we're going with 48 meters, guys. So that's going to be our delta R. No, not radius, sorry. This is going to be length of spacecraft. So we're going with 48 meters. Perfect. And so given, given these numbers, we have everything we need to be able to, to determine exactly what would be the differential force on the surface of, in this case, a white dwarf. So using this information, and again, we're not done with the problem. We still be able, we still need to find out exactly um, can the spacecraft handle this differential force? So. And this actually might even end the problem, depending on what the, what the solution is. Um, so we're going to go ahead and plug in our values. And for, the, and for the most part, and this is bad whenever you're doing a problem, but because I don't want to take a lot of time having to worry about writing in the units, we're going to just leave out the units and worry strictly about the magnitudes, um, the physical, like, quantity itself and not without the unit. So in the case of the gravitational constant, um, I think it's 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 11. I have to, I'm, I'm going to have to definitely look it up though to make sure that it's right. Wait, can you, and you guys cannot see what I'm looking at here. I apologize. So let's do this. Let's get rid of that. And so what I was doing here was writing in, so our, our, I've already written the values for the mass length of our spacecraft and the mass and radius of our white dwarf. And now I'm just basically just um, plugging in the values into our equation there for differential or for tidal force. And so I was stating that um, the gravitational constant is 6.67 .6 times 10 to the negative 11. And just really quick, I'm just going to look it up. Yeah, that's right. And this this is the um the constant in terms of SI units. This is what the magnitude of it is. All right. And so the next thing we're going to need, of course, is to put in the product of the masses. And so we're going to have 1.2 times 10 to the 30. And we have 8.5 times 10 to the 4. And so with the radius, that's going to go in for R, we have... And this is cubed. We have 7 times 10 to the 7. And lastly, for the length of the spacecraft, which is r, delta r, excuse me, we have 48 meters. Which I'm just going to put 48. Typeset that. And so this is the math we're working with. And the fact that it's negative is just the fact that it's being attracted to um, the center of our white dwarf. It's more so an issue of like direction. If we're worried about the shrink of the magnitude, we can we can ignore the um, which in this case we are only concerned with the magnitude. We can ignore the negative sign or leave it. And 
And so what we get from this, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use my calculator to, to do this really quickly, and hopefully I do not make a mistake with this. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 divided by the denominator. So 2, 6.67, and I can use E, which is going to be negative 11. Um, 1.2, E, 30. We have 48, we have 8.5 E4, and lastly in our denominator, this is going to be cubed, we have 7 E7. And so given that we're using SI units, this is going to have to be in, in, in units of Newtons. I'm getting on the order of 1.9 kilonewtons. One point nine kilonewtons is what I'm getting from this. So this is going to be the differential force across our spacecraft. And just because I'm curious, Just because I'm curious, I'm going to end up dividing this actually. I'm going to divide this by the um, the mass of our of our spacecraft, which is 8.5 times 10 to the four. And the reason why I'm doing this is because it will allow me to understand well, what the differential acceleration is. Because remember that force is equal to mass times acceleration. And so um, we can determine what the differential acceleration would be is by dividing by the mass of our, um, of our spacecraft. And so let's take all of this. And the reason why I'm doing this is to kind of get an idea of whether or not we even need to continue with this. Because if the acceleration or the differential acceleration is less than the acceleration that we experience here on Earth, then, I mean, that kind of, like, solves the problem. All right, so um, I wanted to divide it by the mass, which was... Everything is running together here. Sorry about that. Kilograms. I just realized that everything up above was kind of running into one another. And so we have our 8.5 times 10 to the 4 power. I can divide that back out. Oh, this is a this is actually very interesting actually. So what I'm seeing here is that if you divide away the mass of our spacecraft and that would strictly give us the differential acceleration. So this and equals we only end up getting 0 0.2, and I'm rounding off here, and this is going to have to be in SI units, um, meters per second squared.
So with this in mind, actually, I mean, with this in mind, and actually, let's think about that. Yeah, I mean, that actually, that actually makes sense to me. It's a less, it's a less massive object. Um, you're only going to be getting, and, and, and as far as as far as what we experience here on Earth, which is like ten um, meters per second squared, this is what. Let's see, of course, one meter per second squared is going to be 10%. And this is, and then point 0.1 is going to be a tenth of a tenth. So this is a very small percentage. It's only 2%. This is only 2% of what we experience here on Earth. You guys have any thoughts about this? So yeah, MPA. So you're talking about, yeah, I'm with you on this, but what I'm what I'm now curious is about is the fact that if you're just looking at the differential force across the uh, across the spacecraft, this differential force is, or if you just look at the differential acceleration, right, and this is going to be the differential acceleration on anybody that we, we put in the presence of our white dwarf. It's only going to experience a, a differential acceleration of 0 0.2 meters per second squared. So yeah, because I mean, actually, yeah, let's, maybe I might be thinking about this too simplistically. Hmm. Alright, yeah, let's go ahead and look at a neutron star. Yeah, let's, let's do a neutron star real quick. So we're going to keep everything for the most part the same, except for the fact that we're going to change the mass and radius, um, the capital M and the capital R. So we need to know what the typical values are for... I'm just going to copy and paste everything I have up here and just make the appropriate modifications. So the mass of a neutron star and I would have continued I would have continued to go ahead and start using the information that you were putting there Larry about the fact of um for example determining well assuming a material for our spacecraft in a shape um, trying to determine exactly if we will exceed the uh, maximum stress that the um, spacecraft can take if it was on the planet of like a, a white dwarf or a neutron star but with the white dwarf I don't think it's going to be much of an issue given what I'm seeing there all right so the mass of a neutron star I need to go ahead and look that up so let's go ahead and switch um let's bring this back up top so a massive neutron star And again, I mean, um, one th one key thing we have to remember here, guys, is um, our mass is going to be limited, right? Because with the white dwarf, you have um, a mass limit. If it exceeds that mass limit, it goes boom. <laughs> it undergoes a, um, it goes it, it becomes a supernova. The same thing with the neutron star, but I think the mass limit is higher. But let's go ahead and see what we can find. The mass limit is higher, actually. But let's see what the typical mass of a neutron star is. So typical neutron stars have a radius on the order of 10 kilometers. So 10 to the 4 meters. Let's go ahead and write that down. So 
So 1 times 10 to the 4 meters. And they have masses between 1.4 and 3 solar masses. Interestingly enough, the 1.4 solar masses is the, um, is the mass limit for white dwarfs. I'd say the name of that limit, but I always mess the name up. Um, and I think three solar masses corresponds to the neutron star's uh, mass limit. So, I don't know where this peaks, but let's just assume that we're going to go with, like, I don't know, two solar masses for the neutron star. Two solar masses is going to be four times 10 to the 30. Okay. So we can go ahead and get rid of the internet now. It was helpful in that, that particular part of the problem. And I'm going to go ahead and just typeset this. This is the new information. And we're going to go ahead and do the exact same thing. But now we're going to do it for the neutron star. And so the information that changes here would be the mass of our, our object. So this now becomes a 4. And the radius decreases even more. So 10 to the 4. And everything else should stay the same. And so now we need to come up with a new value for our force. Again, I'm going to do this on my computer here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 divided by that cubed. So 1, E, 4. This is 2. That's 48. 6.67 e negative 11. 6.67 e negative 11. This is going to be 4 e 30. And lastly, 8.5 um, e, what was that, 4. And so what this gives us is... One, I'm just making sure this makes sense to me, actually, and it makes sense because the radius is um the radius has changed significantly by what is that three orders of magnitude, which corresponds to a factor of three three nine a a billion is that it a billion? Well, the answer I'm getting here is um, and I want to keep this with the um using the SI prefixes. Let's see, it's 2.17, 2.17, wrong spot, 2.17, um, and it's on the order of 10 to the 15. And I'm trying to remember what is 10 to the 15. Is it like a, a peta, a P? I'll just write it out actually. Ten to the fifteen newtons. And so this is kilo three this is five times the differential force. So this one we actually might be interested in like trying to see exactly what the what the um if we're gonna exceed the uh, maximum stress allowed. So 2.17 times 10 to the 15 newtons, and I can, I'm going to, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and ignore dividing it by the mass and seeing what the, um, 
and seeing what the um, differential acceleration is going to be because I can already tell it's going to be a lot, far more than what we have here on Earth for acceleration. Let me quickly look at the at the comments here. Yeah, it's into the 15 newtons. He said, um, 12 kilometers in radius, which is, that agrees with what, yeah, it's on the same order of magnitude of what we used. Hey, Uncle Bill Druin, um, you're still here. Great. Thank you for staying. Um, I'm seeing now that Larry was actually using some values. I want to make sure that the values that I'm using it's close to what he's used. So yeah, we're using about two, 2.01 solar masses. We're using two solar masses. So that's close. So in this situation, we're assuming that, um, that we can ignore the magnetic field. And I believe this will only be true if the spin of the um, neutron star has diminished significantly. Which would, which should happen over time, the um the neutron star should begin to spin down. So yeah, I, I would agree with you, Adam. But in this situation, we're assuming that that the stars have radiated off all their energy, and that in the, in the case of a neutron star, it spun down to so it spun down to the point where we can ignore the magnetic field. Which probably means that it's, it's 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 definitely not spinning as rapidly as as it would if if it were a young neutron star. Exactly, exactly what um what Henny is stating. So it's it's an extremely, extremely old neutron star. Um, I don't know the exact math for it. Well, not that I don't know the math. I don't know the exact answer for how long it would take for it to get to that state. Um, I guess we could do a problem and figure it out, but um, for another stream that is not right now. But you, but given the time, guys, I'm going to pick up this problem. I'm going to pick up this problem with our next stream. And that is, we're going to end up finding out exactly if this exceeds. I'm sorry. So, um, Hanny, I'm trying to understand what you mean by it's the only solid surface. Yeah, we're definitely we're going to pick up this problem and we're going to also probably pick up the problem of figuring out exactly how long it would take for it to spin down to some some specific intrinsic rotation speed. Ah. Here we are at the end of the universe learning. Oh, that's another good question here. So Adam is say, stating here we are at the end of the universe. So that's a good question. I mean, are we really at the end of the universe? Is, will the end, will the universe continue to expand forever, or will it expand at some point and begin to contract? It's it's a lot to think about. But yeah, guys, um, thank you guys for joining. I will be back. Oh, okay. I'm I'm seeing what you're saying. Okay. I'm with you. So um guys, thank you for joining. We will be back on this Friday at 12 o'clock p.m. Central Time. And thanks for joining, guys. I had I had a lot of fun.
wouldn't tidal forces such as, as a binary stars Um, just to quickly answer, hey, Missy, welcome. Just to quickly answer that, um, I'm off the top of my head, I, I want to say, n n well, it depends. Is, is, the, is, the, is the neutron star being tidally affected by some other massive object? If that's the case, then I would say, yeah, maybe it might, it might affect the spin down rate. But if the neutron star is affecting something else tidally, that's different. I don't think that that would affect the neutron star's spin down rate. Ooh, two neutron stars. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I'll have to think about that one, actually. Well, guys, thank you for joining again, and I will see you guys this Friday at 12 p.m. Central. All right, bye.